something like that. He said it in Tamil. I'm translating it because many of you may not know Tamil here. And uh, I said, what are you wanting to do? So he said that somewhere close to Salem in a small village, he had a Kalyana Mandabam, you know. He had a large Kalyana Mandabam and he was hoping that he'll be able to rent it out uh, free, uh, not rent it out and make some money because that's the biggest in that village, everybody will come. And he found out that he was not getting any returns. He said, sir, on the Kalyana Mandabam, I converted it to an engineering college, sir. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Today, so I'm, I'm telling you, there's only one such thing, but if you really look around, all you need, at least in Tamil Nadu, which I'm confident is an arch. An arch signifies this side is the road, that side is the field, this side is this, that side gives you engineering college degree. The rest of it is, uh, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's anyway a virtual world, so therefore, <laughs> so I, that's, a, that's come back to this. So therefore, we really had this and we knew that this is really a huge uh, uh, thing. So we felt that, I think these are something which are from my alma mater, so construction industry, we really looked at uh, there is huge gap in uh, knowledge. And, and I think uh, it, it won't be out of place to mention that uh, I also went through five years here, out of it three years in the civil engineering department. And uh, the only subject we learned in building materials on glass was, glass is fragile, and you can see through it. <laughs> okay. And I'm told it's not very different even now. Okay. So I think, I think because it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it's not a very relevant uh, thing, but it's an important construction material. All the facades are made of glass. But actually, we don't study. This, maybe some metallurgist will have something on ceramics, refractories, phase transformation, glass melting, and all of those kind of things. But really, glass as a building material is really uh, not, uh, not taught. And I think we said that, I mean, if, if my future is going to depend on selling glass, and if a lot of these engineers have all that they understand glass is transparent and is uh, fragile, I think we are in a bit of a spot of a bother. So therefore, we said we had to do something about it. I'll talk about it a little bit later. So we said there's one platform that we have to work on is knowledge and skills. And I think we, we identified that it's a very simple sense that there is out there a very, very uh, limited level of knowledge on glass and uh, the pluses and minuses of glass, how to use it, how to design it. And in addition to that, how to really fix glass. I mean, it's really a challenge. And I think it's a challenge for anybody. If any one of you want some sophisticated glass products to be installed in your house, God help you. I mean, don't come to me because I also don't know how to do that. Okay, there is between me and the ultimate customer, there are at least four levels of people. There is a transformer, there is a fabricator, there is an installer. Uh, you know, thing that I get a lot of calls from uh, colleagues of mine, fellow CEOs, and they say that, you know, Santanam, can you help me? So the first thing that I say is, that we are so big, only if it is 10,000 square meters that we will be able to do something. Then, you know, we kind of reduce the expectations. So he says, no, I only want 100 square feet. He said, no, 100 square feet, you won't be able to give our expertise because we don't, I mean, firstly, we don't have it uh, to give the expertise. <laughs> but at least, uh, you know, it keeps that pressure, so we keep that away. It, but it's really a problem. But if, if any one of you say, look, I want tempered glass, I want a glass, I want in the west, I want to cut down this, I can give you all the products, but I don't think I'll be able to get it to your house without uh, without investing a lot of my time. So therefore, this is really a big gap both in this. The second one, I think, is uh, it's it's really a collaborative world. We discovered that because, for instance, later on I'll I'll cover why uh, we're talking about collaboration. He you know he joked about uh, uh, that uh, we will utilize IIT Madras and uh, research things. We, you know, if we don't collaborate with stay, you know, institutions such as yours, as well as with many other stakeholders or with the government, we will be in deep trouble. Because we have to create an ecosystem and that can only happen only if we are able to collaborate. So therefore, we said it's going to be a collaborative world. So this is increasingly important. Today, I think government is, actually today is a, is a, is a regulated world. 
we know that even in the western countries regulations building regulations uh, you know uh, uh, every single thing drive drive the industry so we i think today it's the same in india today we have a regulator for everything i mean we, we have almost uh, uh, for everything we have a telecom regulator the tra is a regulator so e regulators are going to be there and energy efficiency building design will have a lot of regulations and there is already regulation but it's it's poorly uh, implemented so we know that this is going to be an important area so therefore we really have to have another platform where regulations are going to rule the world what kind of regulations are useful for customers as well as uh, uh, it also is relevant from an industry's technology point of view and and i'll tell you one thing we have we are really facing an issue on the solar because we don't know which fork to go on the photovoltaic uh, currently what has happened is that uh, in the photovoltaic i think the currently about nearly 1 gigawatt which is 1000 megawatt of photovoltaic is being uh, kind of uh, auctioned uh, about 40% of that is going to the uh, crystal and silica other 60% is going to thin films of the thin films of the 60 40 or 45 is going to uh, an amorphous silicon kind of a base another one is going into uh, CAGS we are strong in CAGS we don't have the other two uh, we're not as good in the other two so we really have to decide whether CAGS which is what we think is the best way forward in terms of it has the best asymptotic cost increase decrease that we can see over the generation so we really have to work and the worst would be if you have a regulator who starts to prescribe saying that uh, by good intentions if they prescribe something and it go, the industry goes in direction so we will have to really work in saying that allow the industry to develop don't set uh, too early a prescriptive standard on technology so therefore we need to work on this okay and the last one is of course sustainability i think everybody talks about sustainability and i think it's it's, it's really a, a very very important thing uh, how many of you are familiar with this kyoto protocol anybody can someone say something the last time i asked this question in the interview i had bad answers so i hope i have better answers from you guys anybody some idea or just say it. Uh, like uh, whenever we have some carbon emissions so uh, the amount of carbon we, uh, we can uh, so we are given the point of where to that okay uh, the company which uh, uh, sells more points can trade it good i actually excellent i think it's 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 right so it's basically a carbon trading mechanism which is created a fully adopted by europe okay and uh, unfortunately it has not been a phenomenal success the everybody says it has not been a great success mainly because what they did was when they started in europe they gave very very lax uh, standards for all the industries including glass ceramic steel aluminium which are really energy uh, intensive industries power all of that they gave very lax standards so therefore what happens is there was a lot of carbon credit which are floating because if you have a very lax standard and then you improve it you have that you have a tradable certificate i mean if you have too many tradable certificate what happens to the value of the tradable certificate it comes down so that's really what has happened so this is one way and one of the strongest uh, opponent of this carbon trading scheme is us okay us is completely against this carbon trading scheme although some of the states in the us is i think california and some other places have some kind of a uh, tradable certification for energy efficiency and everybody said that this is a crazy country which it is in some ways and it doesn't uh, really believe in collaborating it wants to muscle its way and us really opposed it mainly because the us energy industry uh, is one of the strongest uh, republican supporters and remember 2000 2008 you had a republican president and there was just no way the oil industry is going to accept something which is going to uh, put its uh, future in jeopardy so because essentially we have to really this you'll have to really take the hydrocarbons out okay cut this back to 2012 you know what is the what is the situation on carbon emissions in the various countries anybody can guess 
So you have UOP, which is really focused, implemented it ruthlessly. In, in fact, uh, our company also has got a carbon credit, and I've not been able to sell it because the prices are low. And uh, so we say, hoping that somewhere the prices will become better when India starts to implement it uh, much more. So therefore, what is the situation you think is in 2012 in terms of the carbon emissions, the CO2 emissions in tonnage? Okay. <laughs> the maximum reduction in carbon dioxide tonnage global emission has come from the US. <laughs> okay. And it's completely from a different trajectory. Guess where it came from? It's not that they, it, it's more than, I think, something like uh, some extraordinary amount. I don't remember 50 million or 500 million tons. They reduced compared to 2007 or 8. Guess where it came from? You can't reduce energy through IT industry. <laughs> In fact, in the Indian, in, in Chennai, it's IT industry which is partly the responsible for the uh, power cuts that we are facing. Just remember that everybody thought that uh, IT industry is, is a, a low consumer of power. But if you really look at it, uh, typically an IT industry uses something like 150 uh, uh, kilowatts per square meter of the space. An IT industry is by space huge. That means one person. 100 kilowatt per hour is the uh, energy that is there. So therefore, uh, 100 watt. So uh, per square meter of space. So typically, one person uses uh, about 10 square meters. So therefore, you can say that one unit is what is used. It's not IT industry. It's actually shale gas. The shale gas revolution. How many of you are familiar with this the shale gas revolution? It has dramatically altered the energy perspective. If anybody was investing. Uh, because of the shale gas. Shale gas is an innovation. Basically, you had horizontal drilling and multi-point horizontal drilling, what they call as massive hydro, you know, uh, fracturing. Shale gas has made such a dramatic impact in the U.S. and it's driven by just market forces. If in 2008 we had to bet on which one would save the world carbon emissions, not one expert thought shale gas would be the way forward. But just four years, there has been a dramatic shift. In fact, uh, uh, I think shale gas now accounts for as much of the US power generation as oil. Uh, so it's, it's a dramatic shift because of shale gas. So therefore, but I, what I'm saying is that when we talk about future, we really have those kind of uncertainties. So I'll come back to. Uh, so these are the four areas that we started working. So I'm going to say a little bit, sell a little bit of what we are doing. And uh, some of that, we have some help from here also. So we looked at knowledge and skills. So we said that, look, there is, we have to shape. Because if IITs have uh, two lines on glass, we are dead. I mean, if, if, if the most influential people from IITs come back and say, look, glass, all that I know is it is transparent. And it is, I can see through it, and it's bloody fragile. And you handle it with care. And, uh, and if you're told that if you break mirror, it's bad woman, what the hell? I mean, we are in deep, deep. <laughs> Deep trouble. In fact, that's what my mother always says. She <laughs> looks at my factory where broken glasses all over the place. <laughs> it's a whole bloody <laughs> bad woman. And it just, by the way, we, we make uh, 50 million square feet of mirror per annum. So we must be breaking a hell of a lot. And part of the reason why I think this year results are not so good is because of all that broken mirrors. <laughs> I think. So, so we looked at this. I think. This is one thing which we started working. And I think uh, I'm happy that the vice chairman of the Glass Academy is here, which is uh, <laughs> your professor. Uh, so I think we started working on this. And I think we have this advisory board. I think you're the thing. We put this as a completely uh, outside thing. We said that e-learning is a way. And uh, we, we said that we had to create an e-learning platform which can be shared by people. Uh, we put that in the public domain. And we had also realized that we need to do a lot of work on skills. So essentially, what we did is very simple. We had a lot of dope in the company. You know, We had a lot of stuff. We are teaching our people, which they don't learn anyway. I'm saying we teach our engineers. We try, I mean, you know, when we get engineers, we don't get IITNs. Because you guys go somewhere. I don't know where you guys go. But <laughs> you definitely don't come to our companies. I think the last IITN joined was 1980. That was me.